These days, Google is synonymous with internet search, to the point where the US Supreme Court is considering whether or not the word Google can be considered a generic term. Still, it's hard to imagine that there was a time on the internet when the all-owning corporation didn't exist, let alone have the world's most popular search engine. Ever since the beginning, the internet, by collecting information from around the world, has had a problem. Simply put, there was too much data. The amount of web servers, and more importantly web pages, increased exponentially, and without any sort of centralized organizational body, it was easy to get lost in the sea of information. The solution? Organize everything into web directories. Either hand-sorted and organized, or automatically collected and indexed by a machine, they centralize the uncountable sources of information on the internet, and make it easy to find what you're looking for. To really get into the histories of some of these, though, we're going to have to take a few steps back. Not just before Google, but before the World Wide Web itself. Long before HTTP became the standard for passing around information on the internet, a much simpler protocol, FTP, was used, and in some cases is still used today. As networks started connecting to each other, though, a problem emerged. There were just too many files available for download across too many servers for users to find the one they wanted. A pretty simple solution emerged, however. A program named Archie, written by Alan Emtage in 1990, would download all of the file listings from all of the popular servers onto his university's local computer on a monthly basis. Then, users could search for a particular file in the local listings through a single command, and tell which server hosted it. Archie itself didn't perform any searches, but it did embody one of the most basic elements of a search engine, automatically forming an index of available files for download. Much like the problem Archie solved, with the introduction of the World Wide Web, it was necessary for users to know where to go in order to access a web page, either by knowing the direct link or by following a link on another page. Tim Berners-Lee and a team of other expert volunteers started manually compiling in 1991 what they called the World Wide Web Virtual Library. The library, much like Archie, centralized information on the web, though being created entirely by hand, had the benefit of not only holding high-quality academic information, but also having the information be organized by category. The only consequence of manually cataloging web pages was that as the internet grew exponentially, the library had trouble keeping up, meaning that its listings remained fairly small. It would be two years until a program automatically indexed web pages, though the program, the World Wide Web Wanderer, was never intended to be a search engine. The Wanderer, considered to be the first web crawler, a program that discovers and indexes new web pages, was only supposed to measure the growth of the web. By hopping from web page to web page, following links and storing addresses into an index, called the Wandex, the Wanderer fulfilled two of the three main tasks of a modern search engine, paving the way for a slew of different automated search engines in the following years. The first of these early search engines was JumpStation, the brainchild of Jonathan Fletcher, while working at the University of Stirling in 1993. His intent was very similar to that of the virtual library, making it easier to find new sites on the young web, but also took cues from the Wanderer by leaving the task entirely to automation. What made his program arguably the first real search engine was that it automatically found web pages, indexed them, and allowed end users to perform a keyword search on the index. Speaking of the index, when Fletcher first launched his program, it ran for 10 days until it had visited every existing website, all 25,000 of them. By the end of JumpStation's run, it had collected information on 275,000 pages. In fact, that significant growth was the reason the plug had to be pulled on the project. It was too expensive. Even after Fletcher modified the program to only index the titles of web pages, the database it was growing was beginning to take up too many university resources. Unable to find anyone interested in financially backing the project, JumpStation, the internet's first true search engine, was shut down in 1994. Within the next few years after JumpStation was shut down, several new search engines sprouted up in attempts to fill the void it left. Between 1994 and 1996, we saw Lycos from Carnegie Mellon, Excite from Stanford, Hotbot from Wired, Looksmart from Reader's Digest, and InfoSeek, the first search engine to sell advertising in its search results, turning a profit for the service, and the first to offer targeted ads based on users' search habits. A lot of these search engines were short-lived, either merging with each other or being bought out by another company, but probably the most advanced of the day was one going by the name of AltaVista. Just like all the other search engines, AltaVista started as an experiment, a digital equipment corporation, known for their PDP mini-computers of the 60s and 70s, in an attempt to make finding data on a public network easier. By 1995, DEC had the Alpha processor, a 64-bit chip, which, when paired with their multi-threaded web crawler, made for an incredibly quick search engine. The speed AltaVista offered became a major selling point surrounding its public launch on December 15, 1995. The other big feature AltaVista had to offer was that it contained a full-text index of the 500 gigabytes of web pages it crawled. 
Previous search engines, like JumpStation, could barely afford the storage space to keep an index of the titles of every web page, but Alta Vista, having the backing of DEC, was able to keep an index for every word in every website, increasing the likelihood that a search would find the page it was looking for. Alta Vista didn't only do search, though. In fact, you might be familiar with some of their other creations, including Babelfish, an early online translation program, and CAPTCHAs. Even though Alta Vista was bought out in 2003 and shut down 10 years after that, it had a good run at being the primary search engine for the web, processing tens of millions of requests at its peak, and even providing the search capabilities for another popular site on the web, Yahoo. Compared to the other search engines of its time, Yahoo was a bit of an odd duck, mostly because for a long time it wasn't an entirely automated search engine like Alta Vista was. Yahoo started out with two Stanford students, Jerry Yang and David Philo, who were simply building a list of their favorite websites a la World Wide Web Virtual Library, under the name Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web, eventually switched to the backronym Yahoo. Rather than searching automatically crawled and indexed websites like Alta Vista, Yahoo had a hierarchical directory of web pages which was created entirely by hand. As Yahoo started to grow, they began to charge for reviewing and listing sites on their page in order to turn a profit. This price, as well as the man-made directory for a time, worked in Yahoo's favor, increasing the bar for quality in listed sites as well as being far less susceptible to spam. In short, it meant that Yahoo results were usually the best of the web. Unlike many of the search engines on this list, Yahoo is actually still around. Granted, the directory has been replaced with regular search, and the company is currently being bought out by Verizon, but that's a story for another day. Last but not least, there's Ask.com, or as it was originally known, Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves was powered by an automatically crawling and indexing search engine, but, more similar to Yahoo, had human editors sorting through search results. The idea was to create a natural language-based search engine where you could enter a question like, what is the speed of light, instead of having to try to guess the right keywords to locate the information. The human editors were critical in matching relevant websites to the more popular questions the search engine was asked, though it could also return automatic keyword search results as well. Like Yahoo, Ask.com is still around, though Jeeves has long since retired. And there we have it, a pretty comprehensive list of the pre-Google search engines, but the question remains, what happened that caused Google to come out on top over all of the other more established services? In short, Google was able to combine the best parts of other search engines. Like InfoSeek, Google sold advertisements in its search results. Like Alta Vista, Google held a full text index of the pages it crawled. Like Yahoo, Google was able to organize content based on quality. But unlike Yahoo, Google could do it all automatically. It all comes down to a little project Larry Page and Sergey Brin had been working on at Stanford University. Their algorithm, Backrub, determined the importance of academic papers by seeing how many times a paper would be cited by others. The more times a paper was cited, the higher its importance. This lent itself to links on web pages, where the more times a page was linked to, the more important it was, the basis behind an algorithm called PageRank. When paired with web searching capabilities, PageRank became the search engine we know it as today, Google. Thanks to PageRank automatically sorting websites by their relative popularity, Google was far more resilient to spamming a single search term to rise to the top of results, a practice that plagued other search engines like AltaVista. Also helping out Google was the fact that it was introduced rather late into the search engine game in 1998. At the time, the dot-com bubble was nearing its peak, and with the resultant pop that killed most of the competing search engines, Google Search had plenty of space in the market to take over, growing to its current state at about 80% of the search market. Nowadays, Google is used interchangeably with web search, and being under the same umbrella as other major sites on the web, like YouTube, it's hard to ignore its size as a search engine that serves an estimated 3.5 billion requests per day. Even so, if it weren't for the groundwork laid by numerous experimental and commercial projects throughout the 90s, we may never have had the giant, incredibly useful, slightly monopolistic, and definitely not evil internet tool we so easily take for granted today.